For the fourth and final session, please welcome Professor Stephen Hicks. Okay. Yeah, suddenly it's the fourth session. I was realizing I have uh, uh, actually blocked things out for five topics, <clears throat> so we're going to uh, go fast. All right. Obviously, philosophy is hard, philosophy is deep. We have all of these uh, smart people who've been debating things for centuries, and one of the big themes for today is that it's a three-way debate on all of the, the major issues. So we've gone through an overview of what postmodernism is in contrast to pre-modernism and modernism. We've looked at some of the epistemological issues. We've looked at some of the issues of human natures. Another huge sticking point is values and morals. Is it possible for us to have knowledge of good and bad? Uh, or is it not the case that good and bad is perhaps arbitrary, subjective, and so forth? So what I want to do is uh, uh, start off by talking about one of the ancient stories here. My, my clicker is here. I'm going to give you a variation on what's called divine command theory. And one of the questioners earlier referenced the, uh, the Ten Commandments and so forth. And so one of the theories then is to say that human beings by nature are not able to figure out what's good and bad. Um, you know, uh, where is Sam? I was going to pick on there. He is in the bed. No, no, I just want to use you as a, as a target practice, right? So if I were to, you know, just walk up behind Sam when he's not looking and just smack him up on the back of the head, right? <laughs> hey, hey. I <laughs> I guess who's not being invited back? <laughs> Right, and then you all said, well, why did you do that? And I said, I don't know, I just like smacking people upside the back of the head. And you would all say, well, that's wrong, there's something wrong with you. And I said, well, what's wrong with that? And you say, well, I don't know, it caused him pain. And I said, I don't know, that's exactly what's good about it. I like causing him pain, right? And you say, well, you're a sadist. And I say, yeah, I'm a sadist. And he said, well, that's sick. Well, what's sick about it? And you say, well, it just makes me feel creepy to be around sadists. So, well, then you're just appealing to your feelings. And all I can say is, well, my feelings are different. And then it starts to sound like we're into subjectivism, right, and so forth. Some people like it and some, maybe actually Sam likes to be smacked around. I don't know. <laughs> no true confessions, please, at this point, Sam. Right? So where do we get morals from? And one of the classical arguments has been to say, if we try to find morals in the natural world, we're not going to, to do so because morals do seem to be tied to our feelings and feelings seem to be subjective and highly variable. And we try to reason about what's right and wrong. We don't seem to get very far. And so if we are going to find moral standards, we need to appeal to a higher source. Uh, even if we know what's right and wrong, we can go back to myth of Gyges in the story of Adam and Eve. We don't uh, uh, often act on the basis of what we think is right or what we know to be right. And so we can't rely on ourselves, this more skeptical argument will say, to, uh, to enforce right morality. And even if we're trying to enforce morality, we know that there's lots of bad people out in the world who do bad stuff and get away with it. And so there's you know, lots of injustice that is just never caught. And so if we really want there to be a true knowledge of morality and an enforcement of morality, we need to appeal to a power greater than ourselves, one that will lay down absolute standards and enforce those absolute standards being uh, put into practice. And that in the literature is what we call divine command theory. So it's a theory about the origin of ethics that says ethics has the nature of a command. Right? These are principles that are absolutely binding for all circumstances and they come from a divine source or a higher source and therefore our attitude toward them is to obey. Now we're familiar with this in uh, Ten Commandments language uh, and most religious traditions will have this as well. It's all part and parcel of the, uh, the, the metaphysics that, uh, that, that believes in higher powers. Also the typical uh, epistemology that says we need to take faith and not question these commandments uh, and then an obedience as a result of that. Now, I want to give you a somewhat secularized version of this that's uh, very prominent in Plato. There's often references to Plato's cave, and it's one of these very fruitful metaphors 
that uh, has, 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 a, has a number of angles to it, but I want to emphasize the, the ethics angle and how divine command theory, even in more secularized forms, uh, leads to a certain understanding of social morality and politics. So the way Plato puts it uh, this way is to say, and there's a metaphysics that's built in here. We have a two worlds. We have this uh, lower world, which is a cave, and you can see in a shadowy way there are some people there. I'll come back to them. And that's meant to be representative of this lower physical world world that we happen to be born into, but then there's a higher world outside of the cave, a, a real world, a higher world, uh, and also there are some people there as well. But what Plato argues is that all of us at birth start here, and if you look closely, there are some figures in this shadowy area, and the way uh, uh, Socrates, who's Plato's mouthpiece at this point, describes, you know, says, this is us. We are, we're born into the world, and we're chained into this lower world, and so these are figures that are chained at the bottom of the cave, and all of their lives they've just been sitting there and they're watching what's going on on the back of the cave. And there you can see there are some shadowy figures. Now behind them there is this stone wall, and behind the stone wall there are some other shadowy figures, and what they're doing is they have these uh, sticks with cut out animals, trees, right, and so forth. And these guys speak and they walk around back and forth and they, they, uh, they, they hold these things up. And there's a fire here, so what that means is the fire projects light and then on the back of the cave there are the shadows. But since these guys have been trapped here for their whole life, they think that's reality, those are real objects. And so the point then is they are starting in a position of ignorance and what they think is true knowledge isn't really true knowledge. And so we all need to go through a process of acquiring true knowledge. Now the way the story goes, Plato will say, is someone has to come along and try to rescue these people. This person will come down into the cave, break the chains, force the person to stand up, and then to turn their head to face backwards toward the light. So we all need some sort of more powerful authoritative figure to come down and break our chains of ignorance and force us to turn toward the light. So the metaphors are are quite rich here. As the story goes, right, we uh, would stand up here, we would turn around, and we would realize that what we thought was reality before was really just a shadow or reflection of something much more real. The light hurts our eyes, it's kind of a painful process, but nonetheless our liberator is telling us you have to look, this is for your own good, whether you want to or not. We find, of course, we've been sitting for a long time and our, our, our muscles aren't used to standing for a long time, so it's a physically painful process as, uh, as well. Now, this ties into, this wasn't your opinion right earlier on, but uh, a very contemporary version of this is parents who bemoan they're teenagers, often they're teenager boys, and what do teenage boys spend long, long hours doing? Down in the basement with their video games and they're in a virtual reality and they're perfectly content to stay down there basically forever. And every once in a while what happens has to happen is the parents have to say to them, right, stand up, get out of the house and go do something else with your life. So Plato is tapping into exactly that sort of mind. By nature, we are lazy and complacent and we're quite content to believe shadows on the wall as our cognitive reality. So what we need is strong authoritative figures to take us up to a higher level of knowledge. So what eventually happens then is uh, one of these people gets dragged and these are people who are in the process here. And you'll see there's the guide reaching down to help pull this person up. Eventually they will get out into the light and you will see true reality, higher reality, including the sun, the source of all light, the source of all warmth, the source of all being. You become an enlightened being. And then you realize all of these higher truths and that basically everything that people believe down in the lower world in the cave is just false and opinions and not real reality. And you are now a member of the elite, one of the enlightened ones. You then, as one of the enlightened ones, have an obligation. If you're self-interested, an individualist, you want to just, you know, frolic in the sun and play with the animals in the higher world, but you realize that there are still poorer, 
deficit people down in the lower world and you feel pity for them and a sense of moral obligation, not to do anything that's going to be beneficial to you, but to go back down into that stinky, dark cave and rescue as many of your fellow humans as you can. Now, of course, when you go back down into the cave, you are enlightened and you go down to the bottom of the cave. And what happens when you go from a very bright place into a very dark place? Well, your eyes aren't accustomed to it, and you start stumbling around in the dark. But of course, you're coming down, you're all full of enthusiasm for your newfound knowledge, and you're saying to everybody down there, hey, I have seen the light, follow me. Right? And what's their reaction going to be? Get out of my face, right? You're nuts, you're crazy, right? And then they'll, they'll start testing you and say, well, what's on the wall? And you say, well, I can't really see in these lower realities, I'm blinded by the higher light. And they'll say, well, pff, this is just a crazy guy. So they're not going to follow you voluntarily. But in fact, you know that there is a higher truth that's absolutely important for them to reach. So what are you then authorized to do for their own good? If they won't come voluntarily, you are authorized and morally obligatory to force them, to grab them, to make them stand up, to turn around, to face the light, to drag them up to the top of the cave, and so forth. So what we then have is a physicalistic, moralistic imposition ethic that's built into a dualistic kind of metaphysics. Now, if that's the case, that the good is not to be found in this lower world, then the important thing is to get out of the lower world, get up to the higher world. Only those special individuals who have access in some way to the higher world have the important truths. They are then authorized to use coercion on the rest of us to get us to follow along in the appropriate way. Very influential story over the course of millennia. And this uh, then in secular form has justified some fairly uh, uh, authoritarian right, forms of education. In religious form, we know that of course, religious education can tend into authoritarian methods as well, obey higher authority or else. Uh, and so that model comes down. So what I want to do is contrast that then very quickly with a more modern understanding, where of course the moderns then want to say, just as we can, should understand knowledge primarily as of the natural world, not as any sort of revelation from a higher authority, the same thing holds for values and that we can give an objective naturalistic account of where values come from. So the argument I want to give is uh, to systematic, uh, since human kids are more complicated, let's start with a simpler species. And what they will say is, part of the problem uh, when we're trying to do ethics is we're trying to think of ethics and goodness as sort of a, uh, a one-dimensional trait. The things are either good or bad, or we're looking for like a, a little metaphysical flag to pop out. This is good, that this is bad, and so on. And what the, the, those who advocate uh, objective approaches to values will argue is, is that value is a relational concept and it's a multi-dimensional thing. So here's a working example just to give you the, the flavor of this. Suppose you're a biologist and you are studying, in this case I'm going to use a falcon. So you have a, a bird and it's a falcon and the point is going to be that the value framework for a falcon is not that mysterious. It's moderately complicated, but when we're trying to figure out what's good for falcons or what's bad for falcons, we can appeal to objective scientific facts that everyone is aware of. So one of the facts is going to be that falcons have needs. They have certain protein needs, they have oxygen needs, right, and so forth. And the, these are facts that are true about the falcon. It's also going to be true that the falcon has certain capacities. It has wings, it has feathers, it has eyesight, it has a beak. And it's a fact about falcons that they have all of these capacities. It's also true that the falcon lives in a certain world and in the world there are certain things that are resources that are relevant to the falcon. Mice, chipmunks, fish, right, this, that, and the other thing. And it's also true that there are certain actions that the falcon can take, visual actions, flying actions, grabbing actions, and so forth. Uh, and all of these are facts about the falcon. So what they will then want to say is that good or bad is not any one of these things, but rather it's a relation of all four of these working together. So we get a formulation, something like the following. These are facts about the falcon. Falcons need protein. Is that true or false? 
And the answer will be true. Right? It's not a subjective fact. It's not a divinely revealed fact. It's an objective fact about falcons and their constitution. Falcons have eyes with certain vision capacities. They have wings with certain flight capacities. Those are facts about falcons. They're not divine revelation, and I'm not just making these things up either. Uh, rodents are a resource. Rodents exist in the environment, and rodents are made up of certain things <laughs> that are called proteins, and that's a fact as well. And these actions that we call flying and hunting, those are real natural phenomena. So put that all together. So the value statement is a relational statement of fact. So it doesn't make sense as a biologist, a pure objective scientist to say what's good or bad for the falcon to the following way. It's good for the falcon to use its capacities, to use its eyes, to fly, to act in certain ways, to acquire resources, to meet its needs. Or, in more particular form, it's good for the falcon to use its wings to hunt rodents for protein. So if you're then a philosopher for falcons, right? you've got a bunch of baby or young falcons growing up, and you're saying, what's, what's the purpose of life? What should I do? What's it all about? Right? Then this would be the answer. Right? You have certain needs. Develop your wings. Develop your eyesight until those are very good. So you can act in the world in a certain way because out there in the world are certain resources that will meet your needs. And if you act in certain ways, you will succeed and you will survive. Now the point of all of this then is to say, we're using the language of good and bad, right and wrong. We would say, if you were to go to a falcon and pluck out its wings, that would be a bad thing to do. If you were in a territory and you just killed all of the rodents and took all of the rodents thing. That would be bad for the falcons to do. So we've naturalized good and bad language. And we're not making appeals to any sorts of supernatural facts and so on. Now, the point then is going to be in part that every species, what's good and bad for it is going to be some variation on this. We have different needs, different capacities, different resources, different kinds of actions. And in the case of human beings, we would start saying things like, well, we also have nutritional needs, but we have a brain, and so we have certain psychological needs. But we also have certain physical capacities, and so it's good for us, not necessarily flying, but to exercise our physical capacity so that we can do certain things, to exercise our psychological capacity so that we can do certain things. And out in the world, there are certain things that if we act on them, we can then incorporate them into our lives to meet our needs. And so in a more complicated way, we would say there are objective facts about what's good and bad for human beings. So we would say things like hunting is good for human beings, but farming is better for human beings because farming is a more reliable way of getting the resources that we need in order to meet our conditions. And we would say things like certain kinds of political systems are better than other political systems because certain kinds of political systems are better at enabling human beings to act in ways that human beings need to act in order to satisfy their needs, and other kinds of political systems seem rather disastrous at crippling or uh, enabling humans to do so or crippling their capacity to do so. So this is the debate between those who want to say we need to appeal to a higher source to get objective values underwritten by God and those who want to argue that we can, as scientists, understand values for human beings but only if we have this multidimensional kind of capacity. Now as we know, I'll keep uh, this uh, section a little bit briefer. All of the skeptical arguments can be brought to bear on value issues as well. And the point is going to be that the postmoderns are going to come out of a general skeptical tradition, but a more particularly skeptical tradition about ethics and morality. They're going to argue that this objectivist account that I just ran by you, that doesn't work. The divine command theory appeals to God, that doesn't work. And so what we're left with then just is, there is no grounding for morality. And so I've got two big name, uh, 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 these guys are not postmoderns, they are post, but, but of the generation that fed into postmodernism, just to give you a sense for where the philosophy profession was at the time. So this is Rudolf Carnap in 1932. 
All value and normative theory, logical analysis yields the negative result that the alleged statements in this domain are entirely meaningless. So there we again, meaninglessness, but the entire domain of normativity, good, bad, right, wrong, better, worse, just that's all just meaningless language. We can't make sense of it. And this is uh, Brian Medlin, published in 1957. I put this one in there uh, because this guy's Australian, so a little, uh, little Australian content, right? Uh, so since most of the other ones I've been quoting are European and American, but the Australians are right in there as well, even though this guy is not a postmodernist. Uh, he's writing in a very prestigious philosophical journal summarizing the state of the philosophy profession with respect to ethics, and as it says, it is now pretty generally accepted by the professional or by professional philosophers that ultimate <laughs> ethics principles must be arbitrary. So just as in the previous century, a se a session rather, logic, language, mathematics, all arbitrary, all meaningless. In this case, right, wrong, good, bad, any sort of a normative statement, also meaningless and arbitrary. And then the postmoderns who are getting their PhD degrees in the 1950s, and that includes Rorty and Foucault and Derrida and Lyotard and all of the others. They're then taking the courses and they reach this conclusion. So therefore, it's all just arbitrary and meaningless and we have to do something different. Now, this is not only a the province of left-wing thinkers. I've got an example here. This is uh, a little bit off. So I was off to figure it out here. This is Joseph Schumpeter, one of the uh, great Austrian economists and one of the, the major theoreticians of uh, entrepreneurism and a very market-friendly economist. But uh, just to give an indication of the state of the profession at that point, he's a philosophical economist. And notice what he says here. And this is going to be important for why people on the left, even though socialism fails repeatedly and they're aware of the failures and disasters of socialism, they have an out or they have a, a card that they can play. Because here is a free market capitalist advocate saying, we may indeed prefer the world of modern dictatorial socialism or the world of Adam Smith, Adam Smith being the first great free market economist on the wealth of nations, or vice versa. Okay, it's a preference. But any such preference comes within the same category of subjective evaluation as does a man's preference for blondes over brunettes. Okay. And that's a very strong statement. Right? Is liking brunettes better than liking blondes? Or vice versa? Can we have a good argument about that? <laughs> And the is, no, it's just, you know, personal preference. You like what you like, right? And then, well, that's a value preference. Do you like free market capitalism? Do you like socialism? <laughs> Lifted people out of poverty, killed 100 million in the 20th century. It's just, I don't know. What do you, that wasn't real socialism, yeah. That's not my preferred, that's right. Should have been 200 million, yeah, I know. Okay. So this is a deeply philosophical point right, with huge implications. And of course, the implication, uh, one of the implications then can be is to say, well, <clears throat> okay, so maybe socialism hasn't had such a great track record, but uh, I can acknowledge that, and maybe that's just facts and your interpretation all right, and so forth, but I still have my preferences, and you can't argue me out of my preferences because it's all blondes, brunettes, right, whatever it is right, that you like. All right, now I'm gonna skip over this part here because it got taken up in an earlier um, uh, question session, but I do want to just mention Jean-Francois Lyotard, who in the 1950s signals, or actually a little bit later, a significant change. And the point is going to be, this ties into the gentleman's question about World War I and World War II, and the aftermath of that, that socialists on the very far left had recognized that basically all of the predictions of socialism had failed, and if you think of Marx as scientific socialism, then you have to say, well, uh, to be a good scientist, you have to, if your theory yields false predictions, reject or seriously modify your theory. That's what re 
reason would demand. So what we then have is a far left theorist, he was a Trotskyite, right, arguing then that what we then need to do is modify the direction of socialism or, uh, and Marxism instead of waiting for the revolution to happen. Uh, that's this part here. Emancipation, that's in the leftist version, is no longer situated as an alternative to reality. That's to say, we don't have this socialist utopia that we have uh, imagined in contrast to reality as it currently is socially. Uh, an ideal to be conquered despite reality and to be imposed from the outside. So that we're outside the system, we're going to come in as revolutionaries and overthrow the system. Instead, what we now need to do is not wait the way Marxism said, we just have to wait for, for, for it all to happen. Rather, it is one of the objectives that a system has seen in one another of the sectors that make it up. So then what he says is what we need to do is actively engage with the current system. Get into business, get into the marketplace, get into sexuality issues, get into the schools, get into the media of communications, and rework the system from the inside. So bring postmodern theory into culture and the revolution, uh, a long march through the institutions as it is sometimes called. So that's a strategic change that the postmoderns introduced in the 1960s and uh, obviously to some effect over the course of the last couple of centuries. Now in our remaining time, I want to take up a variation on S Stephen's question about how do we argue with postmoderns? And how do we respond to postmodernism effectively? Yeah. And can we do it? Yeah. And I want to end on an optimistic note because as gloomy as much of the current terrain is, uh, we do have a lot of assets on our side. I would say particularly we should be directing our attention to younger people who are relatively unformed, however uneducated or miseducated or in some cases stunted many young people are. Young people are still very malleable and uh, they still want to make something of their lives so I think there's a lot of potential for them being our primary, primary target. One thing that is very useful is that the postmoderns have a lot of weakness in their rhetorical strategy. They might be very good with words uh, and so forth, but nonetheless, there are lots of problems with their articulation philosophically and strategically that we can point out. So it's not uncommon for postmoderns, for example, to say all truth is relative. On the other hand, postmoderns also want to say that the postmodern description is accurate. So that in fact, we do live in the dim ruins of the enlightenment, or in fact, professional philosophers have shown that all knowledge is relative and so forth. That's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. And pointing out that contradiction that the postmodern is saying the same thing, then raises a question in any reasonable person's mind, even if they're not able to articulate it. What we find is postmoderns in one breath will make the claim that all cultures are equal, equally valuable, deserving of respect, and so forth. But they don't extend that to Western culture. Western culture is somehow bad and deserving of attack. So on one hand, a kind of multicultural, in some form, relativism. On the other hand, a fairly universal condemnation of one culture. So which is it? Pointing that out is rhetorically effective. Values are subjective, right? so we buy into all of that. How can you combine that right, with your then more particular condemnations of any manifestation of sexism, any manifestation of racism? Right? If values are subjective, then it should be no problem to be a sexist. That's just another subjective preference and so forth. So are you an absolutist? Do you really believe there are objective values or are you a relativist? Make up your mind. Right, put them on the spot. Technology is bad and destructive. Right? There's been a great wave of postmodern angst over modern science and technology, including its uh, destructive power, the ones that gives all of us some pause. 
but the uniformity of the attacks on science and technology from a postmodern perspective does not sit very well right, with the idea that it's one great sin that not everybody has an iPhone, right? not everybody gets to fly an airplane. Some people drive nice cars and some people drive crappy cars, right, and so forth. So if technology is really bad and destructive, then why do you think it's important that everybody have an equal amount of technology and more, right, that you want to give, including like medical technologies and so on? Uh, if by contrast, uh, sorry, on the fifth point, if you really are committed to, well, you know, everybody has their own subjective viewpoints and different groups have their own ways of looking at things, so we have to be mutually tolerant and we can't ever be imperialistic, why then is it uniformly that when postmodernists do come to positions of power, Franklin Tricky as a professor saying, I'm going to use my power to basically indoctrinate social activists or to enforce speech codes and to eliminate Right, certain sorts of speakers from being allowed platforms on stages and so forth. There seems to be a strong authoritarian. Scratch a postmodernist, you get an authoritarian. Right. How is that? So use the contradictions against the postmoderns, put them on the defense, then force them to explain these. Now, if they then say, well, I can't explain it, then they're taking themselves out of the game. If they try to explain it, they have to make a commitment to one side or the other. And when they make that commitment, then you know what you're dealing with and you can attack. Dr. Now, Dr. go ahead. In my, in my experience, and just when it, from what I've seen online and in person, so, so many of them don't seem to have a problem with cognitive dissonance. Yes. And they can point this out. And that's yes. why, you know, facts and data, they throw them out the window. But you can point that out the fact that they're contradicting themselves. Good. And yep. they double down. Sure. Okay, so then at that point you uh, just say, yeah, keep letting them double down and your audience really is the other people who are paying attention because an intelligent person will be able to recognize, oh yeah, you identified the contradiction, that's what you did, good job. If the, the person is embracing the cognitive dissonance, that's not going to be acceptable to a reasonable, open-minded person. So just keep pointing out, oh, now you're just doubling down and so forth. The other person is your audience. All right, some more here. Uh, racism, sexism, and poverty, those typically are the biggest words in the contemporary far left uh, vocabulary, those particular issues. But again, history is a great friend to the Enlightenment cause. Uh, liberal capitalist West is supposed to be racist, but you know, it's very hard or the fact that it was the Western liberal enlightenment relations that first formed anti-slavery societies, first eliminated slavery, mounted the battle against racism, and so on. The one that I, uh, I, I'd like to point out, I shouldn't have to like to point this out, but every single uh, anti-slavery society uh, in the West, first in England, then America, and France was founded by white males. Right? And so if white males really are the bad guys, then we have a big historical fact you know, with. Same thing with respect to sexism or the progress of women. Right? The women were the first to get contractual rights, the right to, uh, to, to open bank accounts, to own property. Uh, uh, and I know the American situation better than others, but as new states were joined to the union, all of them gave women the vote on starting in the 1800s and so forth. And again, it's in the West that modern feminism is born and the great successes. And the historical record should be an asset. With respect to Western capitalists being cruel to the poor, right, rich versus poor, all of that coming out of the far left. Uh, again, you look at the data, the status of the poor in the Western countries is head and shoulders better than the poor anywhere else in, in the world. So the data is, uh, is on our side. Just some, uh, some quick <clears throat> charts. I'll skip over that one here. Uh, I'll get to the charts actually in just a minute. I did want to uh, make a connection between far left and far right again. So right now we think of people as on the, on the far left advocating <clears throat> kind of relativism tied with an emotionalist activism. And this is interesting, uh, 1921, before he comes to power, this is Mussolini. Everything I have said and done in the last years is relativism by intuition. So he is a subjectivist and a relativist in his epistemology. If relativism signifies a contempt for fixed categories, right, the idea that we can define terms correctly and accurately and pick out features of the world objectively, 
uh, and those who claim to be the bearers of objective immortal truth, right? We need to be contemptuous of any sort of objectivity. That's what we mean by relativism. Then there is nothing more relativistic than fascist attitudes and activity. Fascinating. From the fact that all ideologies are of equal value and that all ideologies are mere fictions. We just make them up subjectivistically. This is 1921. The modern relativist infers that everybody has the right to create for himself his own ideology. Yeah, just make up your own and be committed to it. And then to attempt to enforce it with all the energies of which he is capable. All right, now that's 1921. We're almost to 2021. Right? And it's exactly the same, right? Except now we call them alt-left or far-left, right? And so forth. And this is right, supposed to be fascism. It's the right, complete opposite. All right, here's my, uh, here's my charts. Again, Leotard, modern era, enlightenment. We had this one uh, early in the morning. Uh, the modern era was supposed to emancipate us from poverty, despotism, and ignorance. The, the claim of the postmoderns is the Enlightenment and modernism led to the dim ruins, this terrible society, political horrors, and so we should all be angry and activists. But let's take up poverty, despotism, and infinite and look at the data. Right? And the data is a great friend for our cause here. Interested in poverty, world population living in extreme poverty from 1820. Um, this is chosen in part because the Napoleonic Wars, which were extraordinarily disruptive, ended in 1815. So by the time we get to 1820, the, Europe is getting back to, back to normal. But it's striking by keeping the standard the same measure. Uh, almost 90% of the world's population living in extreme poverty exactly 200 years ago, and then that number has gone down to, what would that be, less than 10%? If postmodernists and leftists are really concerned with poverty and solving poverty, they should be the happiest people in the world, and they should be celebrating the achievements of the last two centuries that have made that possible, the data overwhelmingly on our side. So be aware of the data, trot it out. Literacy, uh, literacy rates. Again, if we go back to 1800, almost 90% of the population is illiterate. The Enlightenment embarks on a mass literacy program. Everybody has the capacity for reason, for thinking, for learning. We want individuals to be self-responsible, to make their own way in the world. So literacy is pretty foundational. And so we devote huge resources to mass production of books, mass production of uh, newspapers, putting kids in school, right, and so forth. And what's that number? 14% world population now illiterate. That looks like progress to me. Child mortality, yeah, this is a sobering one. 1800, yeah, about two children out of five would die <clears throat> before age five. Yeah. Yeah, imagine the tragedy of losing a child. Yeah, you have five children, two of them gone. Those numbers are already improved by 1800 in the 1700s and 1600s. Child mortality was much higher. Now, world even the poorest places of the world, child mortality rates are extraordinarily low. Sometimes I like to say, um, this is happiness <laughs> that you're looking at. Because we often say, well, statistics are just abstract, right? It's just numbers on a page and so forth. But this is children living, right? And the joy that they bring to parents, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Um, <clears throat> slavery. 1750, this chart, about 75% of the world's population on the eve of the Industrial Revolution before the American Revolution, slaves or serfs. And right, some dipsy doodles, right? But by the time we get to the year 2000, less than 10% of the world's population is enslaved, and they are in the backwards and, in many cases, hidden parts of the world. So we've, as a matter of civilization and moral decency, relegated slavery to the fringes and put it seriously on the path to non-existence. 
That looks like progress of the Enlightenment to me. Now, slavery is one thing, but then uh, cultural attitudes with respect to living and working and dealing with people of different races and different ethnicities and so on. This is a measurement of tolerance. Are you comfortable living with, working with people of different races or not? So worldwide survey, this was published a few years ago in the Washington Post. The uh, blue, darker blue, so people say, yeah, I'm fine with it. All right, less than 5% of the population express any reservations with respect to living or working with uh, people of different races. And then yeah, lighter blues, and then at this point here, this is more than 40% of the population saying, eh, no, I don't really want to deal with people of other races, but European nations, France is an interesting exception, all right, so we might want to drill down on that, but the nations of the Enlightenment, Scandinavian nations, much of Europe, all of North America, most of South America, and of course, Australia and New Zealand. We live in uh, the least racist times ever in human history, and we're making progress on that. Treat people as individuals, we have no problem. Women, some American data here uh, with respect to sexism. This is just one measure. This is not talking about the right to vote, the right to start a business, the right to have property and sign contracts in your own name and so forth. This is an education statistic. So this is women getting degrees. Uh, the projector is a little out of focus here. This is 1920. So World War I is ending 1950 on up to the end of the 20th century. So this is uh, the number of women getting medical degrees in the United States. You know, obviously not many in 1920, but upward trend, and it's now about 50% in the United States. The green one is doctoral, PhD degrees, you know, significant uptick. The red one, bachelor's degree uptick. Now more young women are getting bachelor's degrees than young males are by a significant chunk in the United States to a lesser extent in Canada. So if you're interested in women's liberty and equality and their right to pursue their individual dreams, that looks like progress to me as well. These are my favorite charts, and I think these are the ones I'm going to end with. This is uh, the world in 1812. Each bubble on here, or each circle, is a country in the world. There's actually 200 little circles there. Uh, big circle, big population, small circle, small population. They're also color-coded. The, uh, I don't know, what, what's that color? Pumpkin? What would your interior designer call that one? Yeah, okay, well, that's boring. All right, orange, fine. Yellow, right, those are the Americas, right? Red, that's uh, East Asia. The light blue is subcontinent Asia, so that's actually India, that's China there. The darker blue are the African nations, okay? But the point, uh, sorry, let me give you some more features here. This is income per person normalized to purchasing power. Uh, $400 per year, 1,000, then it starts to double four four, eight, 10, 20, 40, right, and so forth. So income measures life expectancy at birth across the top from 25 years, 30, 35, 40 years, right, and so on. So the world in 1812, every country in the world is in this lower quadrant. Now this is already one generation into the Enlightenment, a generation after American Revolution, uh, two generations after uh, uh, industrial revolution and so forth. And these nations here, that nation is, can you guess, England. It's the richest nation in the world, income less than $3,000 per person per year, life expectancy about 42 years. This is the United States, and these are France and a little bit behind Germany and so on. Okay, jumping one century, so the Enlightenment is getting some traction. What happens over the course of the next century? Boom. Right. European nations, the United States is getting bigger. We always have to find Canada when we do this. There's Canada trying to keep up, right? And whereas the richest nation in the world was right there 100 years ago, there's now all of these nations that are doing much better. And a whole bunch of nations that used to be down here are now where the richest nation in the world was. That's 1912, just before World War I. 
destruction, Great Depression, World War II, more destruction. So where are we? One more century, 2012. Yeah, yay is exactly right. Yeah. So notice how big the United States is, right? That's Japan, right? Um, most of these are Western European nations. These are Eastern European nations, the effect of communism a generation after the fall of the Soviet Union, but the legacy is there. This log scale is important because if, you know, the center of gravity here is about there, that would be about $18,000 per person for Eastern European nations. The Western European nations, if the center of gravity is here, you drop that down, it's over 30,000, so almost a double difference there. Um, uh, South Korea is up here. North Korea is over here. Uh, this is China. That's India, and here are various African nations uh, as well. Now, the interesting thing is, I'll put it here, is, uh, I'll actually go back. Two centuries ago, just as the Enlightenment was taking off, and the Enlightenment figures are making all these promises about what the modern world is going to bring, every country in the world was in this quadrant. There's nobody there anymore. We have taken the whole world, all of them, doubled their life expectancy, tripled, quadrupled, and quintupled or more the income. That's progress. That's the Enlightenment delivering on its promises. So that's the three charts. If you want to uh, uh, get the data yourself, go to gapminder.org. It's a Swedish think tank, nonpartisan, great data on all sorts of uh, social indicators. And it's a beautiful place to spend some, some time because it just makes you happy right, to realize how much progress we're making right, all, uh, in all various dimensions. You can pick any country that you want and chart its course over the last uh, 200 years uh, along various dimensions. Uh, the data are, are amazing. So the progress is real. The data works. But I do want to uh, leave us with one thought. We've done a lot of philosophy today. Philosophy is hard, philosophy is complicated. I don't think there are any shortcuts. Really bad philosophy, I think, got us into the mess that we're currently dealing with, so we need to have better philosophy. Find the mistakes, the weaknesses of the Enlightenment that are being exploited by the ad enemies of the Enlightenment, and the next generation needs to solve those problems onwards and upwards. So, there was this in this formulation, fact, progress, real. There is a reality, right? I'm making that claim. There are facts of reality, right? And progress is a normative success concept. I'm making a claim, right? And we know immediately that postmoderns will be all over those claims, and so we need to be able to, if we want to use those data, be able to justify that we're going to use words like reality and facts and progress, right? If we can make the philosophical case for those, then we do have the data slam dunk. I think we will win. Uh, I think it will be ugly, nasty, brutal over the course of the next 20 years. Uh, and so we have to man up, or as Sam likes now to say, say it, Sam. Cowboy up, Cowboy up right? <laughs> right, yes. It's a battle on our hands. Partly it's a political battle, yes. A journalistic battle, economic battle. Pay attention, though, to the philosophical battle. Thanks for your attention today. Uh, I hope I value added on the philosophy side of things. Uh, let's get out there. All right. There's some time for questions, I hope. Some wrap-up questions. Uh, thanks very much, Stephen. Do, do you call yourself a neo-enlightenment uh, thinker or neo-modernist? Is, is there some sort of tag? And where, where, are, we, where yeah. are we going from here? Are we just fighting the old battle of the enlightenment? Or, 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 yeah. are, we, or are we saying that, that there's something uh, to add? Yeah, so yeah, labelling is an interesting, uh, an, an interesting issue here. Uh, my current book project that I'm working on, I'm calling it The Meanings of Life and I'm toying with the subtitle of after postmodernism, because I do think postmodernism has been enormously destructive, but part of the destructiveness of postmodernism is just said we're not interested in addressing certain issues and questions, 
And so my thinking is, what are the actual issues that we need to be addressing if we're going to move past, past postmodernism? But yes, I, uh, I think uh, neo-enlightenment is good, um, with an emphasis on the, the neo, because I do think there were some weaknesses in the enlightenment that it was not fully articulated, and even the points that I think the enlightenment, the conclusions were right, the arguments that got there were not very good. And so lots of smart people quite rightly pointed out those criticisms and so forth. So all of those holes need to be patched. At the same time, the enlightenment was articulated in the 1600s and started to institutionalize in the 1700s. We made a lot of progress in a lot of sciences, uh, and so a lot of those arguments need to be updated. So some sort of neo-enlightenment would be appropriate. Uh, if you want to go back further, one of the big divides is between Platonists and Aristotelians and Sophists, if you know your Greek philosophy and your Greek history. So even up uh, one higher level of abstraction, I would be Neo-Aristotelian. Uh, some of the philosophers, I think, who have done very good work in the, the last century, there's quite a few of them, but I would name Karl Popper, Ayn Rand, and any number of other thinkers who are neo-Aristotelian, neo-Enlightenment is doing very good work. Also, I think uh, uh, even from uh, people who would not agree with my particular takes on all sorts of issues, they're nonetheless very good at criticizing the Enlightenment, or sorry, criticizing the postmodernists, including some people on the reasonable left. There, are, there is a, a big divide even among the leftists between those who are still realists, who think that left politics is morally correct, uh, and the postmoderns who have a very different approach to their left politics. So find allies where we can. One thing I might, might recommend, if you are interested in good critiques of postmodernism, not only on abstract philosophical issues like the ones that I've been uh, walking us through today, but postmodernism in the law. There's a very good book by Farber and Sherry that I would recommend. This is at my website, so you can, uh, you can Google this if you want. Uh, Farber and Sherry on postmodernism in the law. If you're interested in the postmodern attacks on, on uh, science, then uh, one of my former PhD advisor, she was a student of Karl Popper at London School of Economics. A House Built on Sand uh, is one that I would recommend uh, having a look at. That's Noretta Kurtke. If you're interested in postmodernism in literature, there's a book by John Ellis called Literature Lost that I think is very good on literary postmodernism. There's an Australian author, uh, Keith Windshuttle, who is a historian. Uh, and I remember reading his book some years ago, thinking that that was a very good taking up of postmodern applications to historiography. You know, whether you agree with all of his particular conclusions and alternatives to postmodernism, I think he was very good at diagnosing the damage that postmodernism has done in history. So people are fighting, uh, fighting the good fight, and I would, uh, I would recommend those authors. So uh, as for me, uh, sometimes I think the... Uh, I don't know if I, I want to go too far down this road, but I really like the label. It's an, kind of a too many syllables, but I like entrepreneurialism. Right? You know, so the idea that in fact you're, you're, we're all the entrepreneurs of our our own lives. So the way an entrepreneur thinks, you know, that it's up to me. You know, that the world's not just going to hand me a ready-made career, and I just kind of fit myself into a pre-existing slot that I look out at the world and I see what's possible and I figure out what I really want to make the world into and then I shape myself into the kind of person who can do that and then I go for it. So the way an entrepreneur functions in the business world, generalize that to your whole life. So ah, semantically entrepreneurialism mm, doesn't work, So, but something like that. Okay. As we've uh, touched on today, postmodernists highlight collective identity. It's a big chunk of uh, our discussion. Do you see, and if so, to what extent has Hegelian social thought influenced collective identity and possibly truth and composited into postmodernism? Okay. Wow. <laughs> all right, so here we have a deep thinker. I didn't say anything about Hegel all day. And that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Professionally irresponsible. Okay, here's the uh, here's the Hegel 
deficit. You know, I think absolutely right. Um, Hegel is the generation after Kant. I did say Kant, but then I skipped to Kierkegaard, and I skipped to Marx, and right, and so forth. So Hegel and Fichte are two important transition figures right in that point. So Hegel doing much of his writing in the earliest, earliest decades, rather, of, the, uh, of the, uh, the 19th century. Now, Hegel, yes, is influential on the postmodernists for a number of reasons. And someone like Richard Rorty, for example, is on the record as saying, look, uh, if you're a professional philosopher, no matter where you start, if you follow the path all the way to the end, you'll find that Hegel has been there before you. <laughs> Something to the effect of that. So in effect, Hegel does uh, announce the end of history. And it was interesting that when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a very famous American political scientist, uh, Francis Fukuyama, who kind of re invoked a Hegelian theme saying we have now reached the end of history. Now what he didn't mean was that things wouldn't happen but that really all of the ideological options had been tried and we'd had this great battle between the socialists and the liberal capitalists and the liberal capitalists won and so there's no more debate and basically the rest of history is going to be a liberal capitalist one. So he's a little bit optimistic there but that's sounding a Hegelian theme. Now, what I think is uh, is interesting is that the postmoderns will, uh, there's some generations here, but there are some themes that consistently come from Hegel that you find in all subsequent generations that the postmoderns pick up. One is this theme of collectivism. Hegel very much is a collectivist, and, uh, and part of his innovation is to say, if you want to understand yourself, you can't think of yourself as an individual self. You have to realize that you're a fragment of something larger than yourself, and that really the self is just along for the ride. History has various forces that are taking you where they want you to go. So there is no self, there is no agency. Instead, in the history, we'll choose certain special individuals once in a while, so, you know, individuals like Julius Caesar and, and Napoleon, so he has this great man theory of history. Those people will rise up, and through nasty, amoral, brutal methods, right, they will make their mark on the world. And uh, we can't use kind of bourgeois, individualistic morality to drudge these great figures. It's history. And so anything is justified if it's taking history on to the next generation. So the postmoderns who do seem to uh, adopt a very collectivized mentality and when, the, in, when in their activism, they don't seem at all interested in seeing other people as individuals or treating other people as individuals. They're willing to smash individuals for the good of the cause, to advance the cause. That's a Hegelian remnant as well. Uh, Hegel is very striking in, you know, he's typically seen as a figure on the, the far right, but Marx was uh, an early Hegelian and broke away from Hegel and just had a more materialistic version. So uh, Hegelianism in, uh, in, a, in a far right form and, and Marxism in a far left form, they do seem to converge um, as well. So that's a start. There are other things, but we don't want yet to turn this into a Hegel seminar. That'll be next time. So I'm wondering whether the attractiveness of victimhood comes from uh, that it is too hard um, or it requires too much effort to be a responsible and moral individual. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I think that's right. Uh, I think a lot of people are, the gentleman you mentioned, lazy in some respects, or they're afraid. Um, and it is true that Enlightenment liberalism, very broadly, uh, is a very ambitious project. It says you are free, your life is yours, but you're also then fully responsible for it. And for some individuals, that's hard. And so that why is why I think you have good parenting, good social network, good teaching, when you're dealing with young children to build up the power of their mind, the power of their body so they can take on that big project is absolutely essential. It does make sense then that people who are not educated, miseducated, and stunted, they will give up right, very easily. 
So to come back to my entrepreneurship theme, uh, I run a center, research and teaching center for ethics and entrepreneurship at my, at my university. And when we do our studies of the psychology of entrepreneurs, one way of looking at it is negatively. You look at people who didn't become entrepreneurs and you ask them, why didn't you become an entrepreneur? Uh, and they will say things, you know, I had a good idea and I really kind of wanted to. And I think it was a, it was a good idea and I, I really felt, but, uh, and then when they're honest, they will say, eh, you know, it was easier to watch Netflix. And they, they will realize, yeah, 10 years later, I just didn't get up off the sofa. And so there's a kind of laziness right, that happens there. And many of them will say, um, I was afraid. You know, I, you know, the, the idea of <laughs> not being able to pay the bills, right, not having the secure paycheck, I, uh, I let that get the better of me. So laziness and cowardice. So then the question is for, for good character education, a positive education, how when we're dealing with young people, how do we develop a proactive energy? Now I think nature is on our side. Children are naturally energetic and they want to get out there and do so. But we need to have good parenting methods that encourage that rather than stunt that and good educational methods that don't. And I'm going to start ranting at any moment because now I'm starting to get angry because I think about what happens to most kids when they are sent to mainstream schools. Yeah. It, uh, to, it, well, I'm, I'm not even concerned with the indoctrination. Actually, I am concerned with the indoctrination, but that's not what I'm thinking about right now. The idea that you take kids and you make them sit for six or seven hours, how unnatural is that? And you make them sit in rows, and they have to ask permission to do anything. May I go to the bathroom? I mean, that's dehumanizing in a, in a sense. Right? And sometimes the teachers will say, sorry, is it number one or number two? Right? And you are expected to listen to the teacher passively and to do what the teacher says. And all of the kids are to work on the same problems and the same chapters and to do the, answer, the same ways. And the answers are all at the back of the book. And you had better not fail. Right. And you do that for 12 years, that crushes the humanity right, of young people. So, um, okay, that's my little rant right, against the way education is mainstreamed done right now. So that is going to set people up uh, not only for not being able to do anything, but it just inculcates passivity, it inculcates following authority, it inculcates... Uh, uh, um, the idea that the answers are already known and I don't need to, to activate. So uh, it makes sense then perfectly to me that we have a large number of young adults who have given up. Right? And they're genuinely going to be afraid of the world that is out there. And then you'll have lots of pathological responses. So indoctrination, I think, is a part of it, but then also that sort of person... Uh, you know, is prime material for indoctrination as well, so. Thanks, Professor, it's been great all day. Okay, um, great. It leads into my question a lot, because I've got children, you just made me think of it. My, I know my children come home, and the, I feel sorry for them because they've got me as a father, <laughs> so they'll question the authority of the teachers, and they'll come home and say, but Dad, they said Australia was invaded, so what do you say to that? You know, so if all this stuff constantly... Sorry, Australia was... ...invaded, so there's this whole invasion... Thing that we learn uh, in history now, okay, okay. that or whether it's settled or invaded or what, there's no, okay, but sure. there's no nuance in that. It's pretty bold faced, and so I'll have children actually get into my eldest daughter in particular will get into trouble because of it. Which leads to my question, which is the role of big government and all of this. And I know someone I've been an arts practitioner for 30 years, and the difficulty because all the grants yeah. go to whoever's going to say the right thing, and it's always usually about victim politics. And it's just all the shibboleths taken from, you know, the postmodernist talk that you've given today. Mm -hmm. So you come up against it all the time. But they're the ones getting the money and the funding, et cetera, getting, you know, celebrated as being successful as a result of it. And you stand against it. You swim against that stream. And yep. it's, it's demoralising. It's actually yeah. demoralising. And I'm not surprised that the uh, suicide rates is actually as high as it is because yep. I think it, uh, it you know, it's, let's be honest, that's why we're here to some okay. extent. Yep. I don't know what you think about that anyway. No, I think about that a lot. I have a 51-hour uh, 
course on philosophy of education that's all available online. And so I've taught philosophy of education for, for many years. So I've thought about alternative models of education. Now you're asking a, a narrower question about politicization of education. And okay, in one sense, it's not surprising. Uh, governments are monopoly institutions. And so if you're signing up for government education, then what you are signing up for is to say, we want politicians to decide one set of views that are going to be enforced. And not only are governments monopoly institutions, they're institutions of force. It's backed up by police, it's backed up by the military, everything that the government does. So do we think that education should be a monopoly force institution or not? And that's a political decision. People come down on different sides. Now I'm on the non right side of that. But politicization is one set of issues. We also know, though, that the indoctrination can happen in private schools as well. There's a long history of religious educations, right, in, in many in many systems, in the private system, and they will have a monopoly indoctrination view as well. So uh, if you believe in diversity of thought, if you believe that individuals, young minds, should be able to explore and experiment and go at their own pace, that educational model needs to first be articulated, then whether it's delivered through a political institution or whether it's delivered through a private institution, that's a second uh, uh, issue that also then needs to be addressed. Doctor, could I just, I just add that uh, the corporate sector aligns itself with government because it's looking for contracts, I suppose, from government. Yeah, so sure. therefore it aligns itself with it. So yeah. again, no, there's I would no say, way to turn. I would say, yes, yeah, split decision. Some corporations are, are lining up. There's huge amounts of education dollars available. And so if you can become connected, then obviously you've got a, a gravy train there. Other corporations are trying to be entrepreneurial and set up uh, uh, a non-profit in some cases, in some cases profit models to try to experiment with different education systems as well. So this is why in part I'm, I'm very optimistic about the promise of online education because uh, to the extent that young people find that they are being stunted and they're not actually learning things, they go looking on the internet and of course they find all kinds of wacky stuff there as well but the ones that are directed in the right, right, right direction. And parental help, I think, is very important here. They can get a good education. So right now, I'm very much in favor of building as many parallel alternative educational institutions online and offline as we possibly can. Let the experimentation happen. Um, go for it. Yeah, Michael here again. Um, yeah. Just in, in your final slides there, you, you presented the, um, the optimistic story of progress. Um, what, what I've found reasonably common in, in talking with people on the left or the, the postmodernists is that they kind of sidestep that whole story. They don't want to talk about the past or, or, or the fact that things are better than they were. They tend to want to mount the argument as, yeah, but they're not perfect yet. Yeah. Um, sure. So they don't want to really say or admit that, okay, there's less racism than there was, but there still is racism and, and yeah. it's still not perfect. Right. So you find yourself fighting against, you know, a sort of ghost of, or a, a kind of, you know, perfectionist view. Yeah. I mean, how do you deal with that or how have you yeah. found that successfully dealing with that? In yeah. fact, they don't want to be brought back to reality really. Yeah. Well, I think it then becomes a, a, an issue of scale. I think a lot of times, of course, people on the left, they don't want to deal with the history because then if you acknowledge the history, then you ask, have to ask, well, who gets the credit for the progress that we have made? And it's not the left. Right? Socialism didn't do that. Right? Right. Then you have to start saying, yeah, capitalism has done a lot. Liberalism has done a lot. The Enlightenment Scientific Project has done a lot. Liberal and so forth has done a lot. They don't want to give credit to the political and other ideological enemies that they have been arguing against. So a historical amnesia uh, fits with that very well. Now the other part of it though, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to. I'm fine with saying, you know, we've cleaned up 90% of racism, but there's still 10% of racism. You know, we should not be tolerating that. We should be, that, that should irritate. I don't think there's any excuse for a 21st century person to have a racist bone in their body. That just doesn't make any sense to me. There's something wrong with anybody who is racist in the 21st century. So we should be very vigorous about the residual elements of racism in our current society. But that should be scaled right, to the fact if you then want to say, yes, 90% of people are basically fine, 10% of the population, they've got some problems. If, 
However, what you're doing is saying, I think that we live in a deeply racist society and everybody is a closet racist and so forth. That's a different kind of problem. That kind of leftist is disingenuous. There's an agenda at work there. That's right, it's, a, it's an easy, cheap shot, right? So when I was younger, everybody was a fascist, if they were, right, or, you know, I guess, you know, everybody was, everybody was Hitler, right? Now everybody's a racist or everyone is a... In reality, you're kidding me. Yeah. It's tough to define racism, though. I mean, look, some people think... Sorry, Sorry. Uh, we have a... Hi again, Doctor. Ah. I'd just like to ask you, do you want to take this opportunity to respond to your critics? Because over the last couple of years, you've harbored some criticism from people like, I don't know if you've heard of this YouTube channel called Cuck Philosophy, who's got a video that's pretty popular about you. Would you like to just say something to them? Yeah, I haven't seen the, the video yet. Some people have sent the video to me, but when it came out, I got a whole bunch of uh, uh, this fellow's followers calling me all sorts of nasty names and doing silly stuff. So I just initially assumed it was some sort of flaky person. So if I know what the criticisms are, I'd be happy to, uh, happy to respond to them. Now, what I can say is um, uh, my, my book has been read by professional philosophers, and I've been responsive to the professional philosophers' reviews, because those are thoughtful people, and there's lots of issues about which there are nuance and so on. So I'm much more likely to be responsive to those than a an internet guy, unless, you know, I'm open to the, knowing what the criticisms are. Um, uh, yeah, the point's sort of uh, passed on, but it, it's kind of um, relates to something we were talking about a little bit before in uh, group identity. Uh, racism is defined differently by different people. Some yeah. people think that um, uh, wanting your kids to marry or sort of like encouraging your kids to marry within their own uh, race is racism. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's spots where that gets tricky. Um, also, um, group identity uh, uh, can be biological. Um, it's been shown that um, uh, the temperament, for example, is uh, very much, um, varies very much by um, ethnicity. And also... Um, Sorry, are you switching from race to ethnicity or using them synonymously? Uh, well, I mean, inherited traits, I guess. Uh, I guess race is, you know, it's kind of a, a murky concept. So is ethni ethnicity in a way, and there's a bit of crossover there. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I wonder what, what you think about that. Um, right. No, I, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I... I think we should be able to define all of these concepts. This is my modern enlightenment person, right? Race picks out something, and, and either it does or it doesn't, and whatever your criteria are, you should specify what those criteria are. Same thing for, for ethnicity. Now, my understanding is that those are distinct concepts, that race pick, is alleged to pick out biological features, and ethnicity is to pick out cultural features. So you might say, for example, the Finns and the Swedes they're basically racially the same. There's not really a significant biological differences, but there are big ethnic differences between the Swedes and so on. So if we go down that road, and I think that's a, a fine cut to make, then we have immediately right, clarified. Now then the next thing is to say, what does racism consist in? And it then is a claim that there are biological differences among groupings of human beings, and those underlie physical and uh, 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 psychological macro traits. And to a large extent, I'm agnostic on that. I don't look at that literature right, very closely because from my perspective as a philosopher, I don't think if there are any minute differences that, are, that matter there. And I've heard from medical professionals that there are differences and right, this, that, and the other thing. I don't think it makes any difference philosophically. I don't think, as you say, as a, as a philosopher, uh, I'm going to say you should think for yourself. And whether there are minute differences among races, and that's not going to change the principle. And I'm not saying that this race you should think for yourself, and that race you shouldn't think for yourself. The general principle holds. If it's uh, true of the human condition that we need to be honest and take into account all of the facts of which we are aware before we make up our minds, then that intellectual honesty, I don't think there's any racial difference, right, and so forth. Uh, just as I would say, you know, the fact, you know, Einstein was a pretty smart guy. I mean, suppose that, you know you come out with your scientific intelligence theory and you prove that Einstein is 2.3 times more intelligent than Stephen Hicks is. 
Okay. I'm fine with that. But what normative differences, does that mean he gets to vote 2.3 times and I only get to vote once because he's 2.3? No, it's not going to make any difference politically. I'm going to have the same rights that he has, the same character traits are going to play and so forth. So I think a lot of that uh, doesn't matter at the, the philosophical level. Same general epistemological conditions, the same moral principles, the same political principles are going to, going to apply. So even within any given race, if you have people who are moderate intelligence, right, they are no more or less human in terms of moral character and political rights than people in the same race, however you've defined it, who are, say, twice as intelligent. Right? That's, a, that's a, 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 an issue that comes in at a different, uh, at a, a more applied level of abstraction, not a, not a philosophical level. Now then what I would say is that understanding of racism, so I don't really think race is a philosophical issue, it becomes a biological issue, but you're right that it is a murky term, and what has happened is that those who are invested in race theory, they have been constantly shifting the goalposts for what counts as racism. So typically racism then early on meant explicit attitudes and behaviors uh, that put down members of other races. And then as that overt racism declined, then they would start to say, well, even if you don't say and act negatively toward people of other races, there's secret racism or subliminal racism inside you that only critically trained people can discern. And so we start microanalyzing everything that you say to try to find that hidden racism right in you. Right? Or if all of the official laws and customs of a culture have been reformed and to eliminate all of the double standards against certain races and so forth. So all of the overt racism has gone away. The argument then will shift, well, there's still institutional right, or structural racism, which is very murky and hard to define. So what you then do find is people who are intentionally muddying the territory because they want to keep moving the goalpost because racism is a very powerful political rhetorical tool to you. So I think that approach is disingenuous. Thank you. Professor Hicks, uh, thanks for a great day. Question I have for you. Uh, you mentioned the word entrepreneurship and my experience obviously in Oz and of course the States has been around that space. But taking on what you said, um, there's a prestigious school in this town that we do work for and it's a program we actually run on entrepreneurship and the principal actually told me entrepreneurship doesn't really go down well here and this is actually a boys school. Mm. Uh, the funny thing about it is the parents love the word entrepreneurship but somehow the teachers have got a problem with it. Yeah. Yes, well, that's true. I run into that a lot in my, uh, my research because uh, yeah, entrepreneurship uh, from that perspective is a code for <laughs> all of the things right on the, on the other side. It's self-responsibility. But if you don't believe in selves, then you've got a big problem from the get-go. It's individual right, responsibility. And if you are a collectivist, then you don't want to go there. It's about free action. It's about creating value. It's about mutual trade uh, and mutual beneficiary. But if you are bought into a group adversarial mindset, then that's just, yeah. And then of course, capitalism, right? <laughs> Capitalists celebrate, right, the entrepreneurs. And so if you come in with anti-capitalist attitudes, it's also inappropriate. So yes. Professor Hicks, uh, thank you for coming to Australia and My sharing your pleasure. knowledge with us. I do think we have a similar sentiment on the education system. My question for you is, what advice would you give to somebody who has been through the school system for 12 years and spent another eight years at university and is now trying to go into the real world but is very anxious about it? Yeah, wow. Ah, yeah. Well, um... You seem fine to me. <laughs> so you've got the, the raw materials, the basic capacities that, that are all functional. 
I, I think the best thing to do is uh, what the economists call the, the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, don't dwell on sunk costs, right? So you, a certain amount of wasted time and uh, an investment in things that haven't paid off, just forget all of that, start over. You are where you are. Uh, learn what you can. There's lots of resources available. Follow your own path and uh, make your own life. Yes. <laughs> oh, uh, it's Protoss. Uh, I've got two epistemology questions for Professor Hicks. Uh, first, I've noticed that when, when altruism, uh, you know, making ethics centered on others, when altruism enters a conversation or a, or, or a discussion, uh, uh, intelligence stops. There's a kind of a cognitive aborting whenever altruism happens. And I, and I, don't, I cannot explain it, but it's just something I've observed over the last few years. And possibly related to that is, I wonder if you could say a few things about hate speech as an anti-concept using Ayn Rand's uh, notion of an anti-concept. Right. I, I, would, I would really value any thoughts on either okay. of those. Thank you. Yeah, so those are both uh, very interesting issues about normative concepts, which are complex and uh, for various reasons difficult to f define by well-meaning objective people, but then also subject to all sorts of uh, ideological slipperiness as well. So I think part of the issue, of course, with altruism is that altruism is used by people to mean two completely different things. Right? There is for some people uh, the idea that altruism just means kind of respecting other people, being nice to other people, being benevolent and so forth to other people. And so uh, to be altruistic in this sense seems like an axiomatically good thing to be. That a good person, of course, is respectful of others, and of course, others should be respectful. And so, as long as the person is in that framework, I would say that they are confused in terms of the language, but you judge that person as an individual and you just have a conversation about how they're using that concept. And do you really just mean benevolence? Do you mean really just respecting other people's individual rights? Do you really mean that we should be going for the win-win? Is that what you really mean? And then the conversation can, can pick up. Uh, so of course, where philosophers get, get irritated is that that's a debasement of the original meaning of altruism. Anytime you have an ism attached to a word, that's to say it's a heavy duty principle of action. And so then the question in this case is, what should our fundamental set of moral obligations be? Is it the case that each person has their own life and you're responsible for yourself? And that should be kind of a mutual respect that we all have uh, as, as it's played out. Uh, so, you know, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all of which are individualistic. Um, uh, or do you want to say that no, those are all individual rights and that's not where we are starting for. Instead, your fundamental responsibilities are to other people and altruism in the August Comte sense, the guy who the philosopher, sociologist who founded this, this is exactly what he meant. You should not see yourself as a morally uh, bottom line being, rather you exist to serve others as a matter of moral and social principle. So altruism means putting others before yourself. Now that then is to enter into a very different philosophical territory. So uh, I don't know how this uh, helps because when you talk to professional philosophers or people who do moral uh, thinking seriously, they will use altruism in that robust philosophical sense. That's one conversation then that you need to have but if it's just the casual get along with other people and respect them, that's a different kind of conversation. So it's the way things go with almost all heavy duty philosophical conversations. So we'll say for example, people should be uh, pragmatic. And for many, uh, you know, yeah, pragmatism is a healthy thing. And for a lot of people that just means you know, being practical, you know, not being starry eyed and wishful thinking and so forth and get, to get the job done. But pragmatism, right, in the philosophical sense means a you know, principled idea that there are, are no principles, that every case is relatively unique and you just see what works in a given situation without trying to use abstract general principles in a situation. So you almost always have to have a, an initial conversation. What do you mean by that important 
concept. Now, the other concept was hate speech. Um, I do think that that is uh, an, an anti-concept uh, um, for, for a few reasons here. It is to try to take certain words off the table. Uh, one piece of evidence that it is being used as an anti-concept is that all expressions of hate are not taken off the table. There are some groups that are allowed to express hate rather vocally and in your face, other groups that are not allowed to express hate. So anytime you have an, an alleged principle that's used uh, uh, with a double standard, chances are good there's a, an agenda at work here. Now the reason why I'm very robust on free speech, including hate speech, is that I do think hate is a legitimate human emotion. There are some things that are, hate is the appropriate response. You know, for example, I hate child molesters. Right? I really do, I just, I hate them. Okay? And I should be fully entitled on any public stage to say I hate child molesters. There, I'm on record. Right? And if someone up comes here as an identified as a child molester, chances are very good, I will walk over that person. I hate you. Okay. And I would like bad things to happen to you legally. Right. Okay. So, hate is a human emotion that is an appropriate response to extreme assaults on your values. To say that people shouldn't be able to express hate right, is to then ask people to stifle a legitimate emotion or to say you shouldn't have that emotion in the first place. Right. But I think that's wrong. That is a perfectly legitimate emotion. Now, there is a role for civility. When do you express hate uh, or not, even if it's a legitimate object of your hate? Uh, and are people hating the right people or not, rational versus irrational forms of hate? All of that needs to be parsed out. But um, I don't think that hate speech is an appropriate uh, uh, concept to be singled out for expression restrictions. Me. <laughs> so I was, um, I live in Argentina, and coming from Latin America. And when I, what I see is that um, the evidence is there, and it's, uh, the evidence uh, that capitalism works, it's, uh, it's reachable for everybody. But at the same time, you see, for example, in Latin America, they keep trying with any form of collectivism even when they know that it's not working. So my question there is, is an ethical thing that people keep trying with socialism because they think that is the right morality based on socialism and it's the wrong morality that is based on capitalism? Or is it more that uh, we take for granted that people want others to flourish and have a good life and live a meaningful life? But it could not be the case that some people don't think the same way. Either they see this life as a, I don't know, like a, a way to, to, to reach another life and sacrifice is good and ambition is bad. How can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a pair of yeah, complicated questions right, put together. Yeah, it is an interesting thing. So if we say track record of the big experiments between the more socialist nations and the more capitalist nations. And of course the socialists say it wasn't real socialism and the capitalists often want to say it, wasn't, it isn't real capitalism, it's some sort of mixture and all of that's fine. But you have to say, okay, some sort of socialism and something close to socialism was tried just as something close to capitalism right, was being tried and the track records are night and day. Misery and death and uh, human rights violations on massive scales in all of the major socialist experiments and enormous wealth and by and large people are free to put together a pretty good life in the, in the more capitalist nations. So if the empirical evidence there is so strong, then this is your first question, right? What explains the fact of people who are still advocating socialism in the 20th century. I think it's a, it's a few things. One thing is that on strongly charged normative things, it's very hard for people to admit that they were wrong. And this is not only a politics thing, it's a more general thing. 
It's hard for people to admit that they are wrong, particularly if they have been in any sort of public position or position of prominence to say the theory that I advocated was false and I publicly admit it. Now, to their credit, there have been some socialists who have done so. They moved to the middle. Some of them became capitalists and so on. That's a sign of intellectual integrity to do so. So I think a lot of it just is bad faith. I don't want to pay attention to the evidence. I want to just continue to believe what I, what I want to believe. Now, there are Others, though, and I think this is the, the 2A, right, the second part of the, the, the question that you were answering there, who, those who will say, okay, I recognize that socialism was a disaster. Millions of deaths, starvation, human rights violations, concentration camps, right, Siberia, right, uh, forced famines, right, and so forth. I recognize all of that really is true. So it was a disaster. I'm not going to deny that. But I also think that while capitalism has been a practical and economic success, capitalism is motivated by the wrong things. Capitalism is motivated by profit, competition, making money, materialism, and I think those are immoral. Even though socialism was a disaster, it was motivated by community, sacrifice for others, putting others before self, collective identity and so forth. And it's just kind of a sad fact of the world that this, from my view, immoral capitalist system is so practically successful and this beautifully moral socialist system is such a practical disaster. So I'm caught in a moral practical dichotomy. Then the next thing is to say, well, if it's a moral dichotomy, you just have to, to choose. Do you think it's more important to be practically successful or do you think it's more important to be morally pure? And many people will say, I think the more important thing is to be morally pure. And I would rather, and some socialists will say this, I would rather that everybody in the world was much poorer, even very poor, if we had a socialist society, rather than there being all of these greedy, profit-seeking capitalists and everybody being a lot richer. So th what this then goes to is one of the big divides in moral philosophy is whether, and I think this is a bit of a false alternative, actually a lot of a false alternative, that are you uh, and should you judge moralities in terms of their consequences or should you judge moralities in terms of their motivations? And those who are on what we call the deontological side will say, morality is about good intentions, it's about having a pure heart, it's about believing and trying to live according to the right principles, no matter what the consequences are. And the other side wanting to say, we can be soft on principles, what we want is the results, and we don't necessarily care as much how you get there, we're going to judge people on do they deliver the goods ultimately or not? So that might be another part of the explanation. Now the particular uh, case, and this is moving on then to your third question, right, about Latin America, right, in particular. Uh, my view here is that uh, Latin America, um, it did have a liberal enlightenment moment in the late 1800s, early 20th century. I'm not at all an expert on this area. But uh, my reading of Latin American history is that it's been dominated by two philosophical and political ethoses, right? The, the more conservative side has been strongly kind of authoritarian, leaning toward militarism, and a certain amount of kind of traditional Catholicism has been built into that package. And then on the other side, we've had strong leftists, uh, typically of a Marxist orientation, kind of the Che Guevara revolutionary uh, type. And that Latin America has just oscillated between those two. Right? There's a military dictatorship that's very conservative, law and order, and, and imposed morality it gets in place, and they do terrible things. <laughs> Actually, they do terrible and bad things. And then people on the other side get outraged and there's some sort of a revolution, but the only alternative then is some sort of leftist revolution. They get into power, they do terrible things, and then there's a counter-revolution, the right gets back in power, and so it's an oscillation. There is not a strong tradition of any sort of enlightenment 
individual liberalism in Latin America. So it's, it's, it's sad. <laughs> so under the rubble, the, the issue is how do you, after some generations of communist indoctrination and impoverishment, how do you rebuild? And it's a, as much a psychological issue as anything else. Yeah, it, but also, I mean, it's partly, it, it's something that they, not only did they think that was something that the other Russian people had to do, but that was something that they had to do within themselves because they accepted that that um, type of living, it's not so much that type of thinking, but living with that type of thinking. You know, like you had the experiment with the two guys sitting yeah. on either side and, and, and they're saying, yeah, it's, it's the same when it's clearly not. When you've been living with that for so long, you know, like when, when you're afraid to, as, as a lot of people would be here, would they be afraid to talk about race in a certain place? Would yes. they be afraid to talk about sex in a, a, a certain place, right? That's something, and I was wondering about your thoughts about how, how to overcome that. Yes, uh, well, it's a cultural relearning process. So uh, sometimes I, I've looked at this through the entrepreneurship literature, and yet yeah, Eastern Europe, and, uh, and including Russia, have had a huge problem because basically from 1945 until 1989, for most of Eastern Europe, that's two generations of people that uh, any sort of entrepreneurship, small business, any sort of thinking of in that way, was just destroyed, it wasn't allowed. And so all of the cultural knowledge about how to start a business and run a business is, is gone. And so how do you relearn that? And it makes sense then in the next generation you're going to then have a whole generation of people, you know, we go in there and say, now you're free, right? And start your own business and become capitalists and Democrats and uh, run your own government and have democratic arguments and so on. Well, we haven't been allowed to argue for two generations. We haven't been allowed to start our own businesses for two generations. We don't know how to do that, and that sounds kind of scary. So it is a relearning process, and I don't have any, uh, any hard and fast predictions about how long that takes. It strikes me that different Eastern European nations are further, or along, or, or further along or further behind on that, on that, uh, on that learning curve. So absolutely, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. I'm reminded, uh, uh, to go back to Protos and his question about the art world, that uh, one of the interesting things is, uh, we haven't talked about postmodern art uh, uh, today, but uh, uh, if you think of a generation ago, standard training for artists involved drawing, and, or realistic drawing, and color theory, and proportion theory, and perspective, and so on. But, to the extent that the modernists came along and in a very deconstructionist way said all of that is out the window, we're just interested in a subjective expression, uh, all of the stuff about color theory, well that's very objectivist, all that stuff about perspective and realistic modeling, all of that is very objectivist, we're not interested in that anymore, and now we are into four or five generations later of art students, and even the art professors themselves don't know right, all of those traditional classical skills as well. So if there's going to be any sort of reintroduction of representationalism in the art world, well, where is that going to come from? It's going to be a, the reinvention of a lot of new wheels, and I don't know how long that will take, because as we know, the transmission of civilization is uh, fragile from generation to generation. It's a lot of work. And the last question for the day. Oh my goodness. Oh, make, make it, it good. good. Well, I hope it's not too naive. It's just a, something I run into a lot um, when talking to self-proclaimed socialists, especially around here. There are a lot of them. Um, and I seem to pretty much identify, I identify them as communists and often I do it provocatively and they take offence to being called a communist. Why do they take offence? I'm not sure. And that's why I'm wondering, like, they go, oh, we're not communists, we're socialists. Mm. Now, am I missing something? Is <laughs> and then they might also be walking with behind them a banner that says Marxism now. <laughs> but they're not communists. Like, for example, Bernie, right. um, Bernie Sanders, he's not a communist. Oh, my. Or Jeremy Corbyn, he's not a communist, but he's yeah. a socialist. And he's not only really that, he's a democratic socialist. Yeah. He's really nice. Yeah. Now, I was just... Is, uh, what I wanted, to, my question is, is there a quick comeback? <laughs> uh, 
Well, no, I, uh, that's a good question, but it's a serious question because my, my view is uh, that there are actually many strains of socialism. Right? So just as if you know, someone says they're a Christian, well, there's lots of different Christianities out there. There's Eastern Orthodox and Protestant and Catholic, and there's lots of subdivisions, right, and so forth. So I'm fine with someone saying, uh, I'm a Christian, and you say, oh, you're a Catholic. No, no, I'm not a Catholic. Right? That's, uh, I might be offended by that, right? Or you're, you're a Baptist, right, or whatever. So just as uh, you know, there, within any religion, there are genus and species relations and agreements and disagreements, the, true is, the same thing is true of the left. So there are some leftists who are uh, uh, classical Marxists, but there are lots of neo-Marxisms that are out there where they will say Marxism classically involves a commitment, say, to these 20 things, and we buy into 18 of them, but not these two. And then some other will say, well, I buy into these 14, but not these six. And so there's lots of subverts. So there's Trotskyites and Leninists and Stalinists and so forth. And all of that, I think, is, is quite fair. Now, I think it's also true, and I think it would be, would be hopeful if you have someone who says they are a democratic socialist and they actually mean that. Because what that means is that this is a person that is some decency about that person. Because that then means that they are aware of socialism's authoritarian history and all of the brutality that has come packaged with the applications of socialism, when what they're wanting to say is, I think socialism is okay, but I don't want to use those authoritarian methods. I want to use democratic methods. And if you're going to use democratic methods and they actually mean that, then that does mean some sort of discussion and debate and consent of the people who are involved. So you can talk with that person. Now, if fairly quickly, it turns out that the person's not actually interested in discussion and debate, they know what they want, and you better believe it, by the way, then their use of the label democratic is disingenuous, and you can call them on that, and then you say, no, you really are an authoritarian socialist, and that means something close to, uh, close to Marxism. So I don't think there's a general answer you can get. All of these discussions have to become customized to the individual you're dealing with very quickly. Can we please thank Professor Stephen Hicks. Okay.